afternoon. Um, I'm Jack Kitchen. I'm from uh, Ericsson's Early Mathematics Educational Project. Um, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to present a early math case study to illustrate this topic. Uh, what does the rigorous and the responsive early childhood teaching looks like? Uh, what you're going to see is a, a short video clip of our CPS pre-kindergarten children working on a shoe graph. The teacher first introduced or read this book called Whose Shoes by Stephen uh, Swinburne. And then she, um, she en engaged a discussion with children and the diff different kind of shoes in the book. Then she asked children to look at their own shoes. What kind of shoes do we have? So she asked these two questions. What kind of shoes are you wearing today? And if we made a book about kinds of shoes in our class, how could we organize all the shoes? After that, she put a, a tablecloth marked with a masking tape in, in the middle, then asked the children to take their shoe and pile it together, then sort into different categories. What we're going to see is the activity after this. Well, anyway, I will just very briefly introduce what the video table looks like. And teacher worked with children to make a shoe graph because first they made a real graph with the shoes. Now they're going to use a, um, different media, different kind of materials to make a shoe graph. Idea so we can make our graph and keep it. In my classroom, we made two different um, real shoe graphs. And I decided um, after those two experiences, the children were ready to make a pictograph and move yeah, from being more concrete idea. to what if more we... abstract. What am I doing? Let's do. Mm -hmm. Diamond. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Diamond. Uh -oh. Let's make no. a little. Writing. Yeah, I'm doing some writing. What if I drew a picture of my shoe? Right? Yeah. What if I drew a picture of my shoe? And then we could remember what shoe we were wearing today, and we could make a new graph. Do you think we could do that? I wanted the students to draw their shoes instead of just giving them a paper cutout, because I think it gives them more meaning to that abstract representation of their shoe. So when we make the physical graph, it's easy for the children to see their shoe on the graph. It's physically there. You know, they're, they're uh, holding it in their hand. It's concrete. When you start to take a step away from that to be more abstract, um, the meaning can get lost in children that are, that are at this age. So by having them draw their own shoe, it gives them more ownership. I also think that by drawing uh, the shoe, it helps them to remember what, how they sorted their shoe in the first place, what the attribute was that they were sorting it in. Because when they're drawing it, you know, I ask them, Make sure that you draw your straps, you know, make sure that you draw your strings to help them remember that that's how we have decided to sort the information. The reason I wanted the students to help construct the pictograph themselves is that if I'm putting the pictures up on the graph, I'm taking ownership of it. Then it's, it's me sorting the information. If the students are doing it themselves, they're the ones taking ownership of their data, their information. It's their shoe, and if they're the ones putting it on the graph, then it helps them to remember, again, that this picture represents their shoe. It's just another step in helping them to make that connection between the concrete and the abstract. Can you look with your eyes and find your shoe on the graph? Wait. Look with your eyes. Look with your eyes. Categories has the most shoes. Just for 
Okay, so this is a one of our uh, CPS classrooms. Um, now, I'm going to present three questions for us to discuss about this video table we just saw. Um, we're going to do this uh, because of time. If you're on the left side, you think about question one. You're in the middle, you think about question two. You think about, if you are on the right side, you think about question three. You see what is middle and what is, I think this is not mathematically accurate, whatever you believe you are, okay? Um, but <laughs> turn to a neighbor and just give you a couple of minutes to discuss what, okay. Let's go to question one. Oh, for them to think about it, the attributes of the shoes, correct? With strings, uh, straps, uh, zippers, right? So children thinking about that. What else? Yes. So she encouraged children thinking that beyond the present of a different situation, right? So you all agree that the children are thinking. Anything else? Yes. Absolutely right. So I'm, what I'm going to do is basically summarize what you're saying. Children are drawing. Okay, they are drawing their shoes with attention to the attributes. Very important concept in mathematics. So my shoes is different from your shoes and from his shoes, right? And they also, as Deborah said, and put the shoes in the graph so they can remember, that's my shoes. Okay, they construct that knowledge. And they like counting and compare, one, two, three, four, five. This category has the most. And they predict it, just like exactly you said. In a different day, that graph would look different. So these children learn math with hands, eyes, ears, and the mouth. They move around, they listen, they see, and they talk about mathematics ideas. But I think you are all looted. It is not just children. Teacher is doing lots and lots of thinking. She said the goal. What that goal is, the goal is to use the data to answer a question. Okay? She chose the material with that uh, stick notes rather than ready cut the papers. That has a purpose to reach the goal. And she grouping. If you remember, that's a large group. It's not a small group. Why? Because a large group is working better for this particular question. Think about you only have four kids. How can you graph, right? 
Then she engaged the math talk. She asked children, "Which category has the most shoes? How do you know?" Okay, that's a mathematics talk. So, in other words, her teaching is a purposeful, thoughtful, and planful. What we see here, both te- children and their teacher are doing the thinking. They both are active in this process. Agree? Okay. Then let's look at the second question: What are they thinking about? Anyone from the middle group? What are they thinking about? Yes, please. Wonderful! You must be a mathematician. You really know so much about, you know, they are um, um, they they are uh, comparing the, the the different shoes so they can really sort, right? They have to have clear categories in their mind or through discussion to generate that category, right? And then then they construct that that um, that uh, um, graphs and they talk about anything else from this middle group. So they really very good. They really engaged into the game, right? They think this is a fun, and they want to listen to others, and they want to contribute. Yeah, Ellen. Very good. You know, Alan is working on the mathematics curriculum, so he does know a lot about this. Okay.、Um, so here is again just summarize all of you what you said is that they are talking about the big mathematics ideas. For instance, they identify, describe, and organize data. In this case, the shoes by attributes. Okay. They count and they compare data on the graph to answer a question: which has more, which has le- less, which category has most shoes? And they understand the data analysis is specific to situation or question. Okay, and we organize data because we have a question. That question change, then your data. Would change the data, the way you look at the way the data, the way you organize data would be changed. And what most important thing is that they mathematize the environment. In other words, math is around us. It is up to us to think about what that math looks like and to create a situation, engage children to the problem solving. Okay, the last question: How did the teacher promote that mathematical thinking? Yes. This was really important. She engaged the children early on with the gridded tablecloth or whatever it was, because they, when you looked at the faces at the beginning of that, they're kind of all going, "What's this all about?" And pretty soon they're thinking about their shoes and looking at differences. If she hadn't started that way and had skipped that step, I don't think she would have had the buy-in. You hit the really right thing. Is a teacher start with concrete, right? Start a real graph, then move a little bit of pictorial. That's a little bit abstract. So, children thinking is a concrete thinker. But we're not just limited to that concrete level. And teacher move that and connect that meaningful meaning to a more pictorial, more abstract, and even to the future what a different day look like. So from concrete. To Victoria, to abstract thinking, very good point. What else? Yes.
Very good. Yeah. Linked literacy to numeracy or to early math is a one point. Second, it's really broad children's perspective, different kind of shoes from different culture for different uses, really help children to see how everyday life can be a mathematics problem. Maria? Very good. So she asked, which category has the most shoes? What did children say? <coughs> On the top. So children really perceptually answer the question. Then what she said? Let's count. So she turned that question into much more mathematically, we call it evidence-based learning, right? This is evidence-based learning. And that's the way what you, and okay, again, I'm summarizing what you said. Making connections from concrete to the pictorial to the abstract. Ask meaningful questions, okay? Would the graph look the same on a different day? And then make suggestions. Good teaching is not just a follow the student's lead, but also create a zone of proximal development to help children to grow, okay? So at a certain point, she will ask questions. Oh, she make suggestions. She said, okay, when you draw, please remember draw your strap and draw the, the strings because that's a very important attributes of the shoes. Okay. So uh, this is only one teacher and one classroom. But in the last four years from two, 2007 to 2011, we worked nearly 300 teachers, pre-K and kindergarten teachers. At the moment, we work another 154 teachers um, on the pre-K and the third grade level as one of our I3 project. And I want to show you the data we have um, produced, and uh, John really talked about data um, in the days, and we produce this high quality program, but we also have child outcome. This is our 2008 and 2009, our data uh, program evaluation using Woodcock-Johnson um, applied problems. Uh, what we found out is compared to a control group, children in our intervention group made an additional three month in math learning. In other words, everybody is moving on over the year. But the children in our group made three additional, three additional gain, three additional month gains in math learning. For those children behind the national norm at the pretest, they actually made five additional month gains uh, in their math learning. So I would say this is a evidence of what a rigorous and the responsive teaching can produce. And I want to end my talk with a um, statement. Um, today when we talk about the rigor, we re often refer to curriculum as standards. But the question is, is it possible to talk about these kind of standards and the curriculum without at the same time talking about the children? After all, we teach children, not the curriculum. We use standards to help children grow, not to ignore their developmental needs. Lastly, curriculum and standards are the means. Means help children to grow, to develop, to reach their highest potential. They are not the goals or the ends of education. Thank you. <laughs>